Okay, hello everybody and uh, welcome to today's ACM Tech Talk. Uh, this webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and professional development, serving a global membership of computing professionals and students. My name is Matthew Caesar. I'm a professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, I've worked in the area of systems and networking for over two decades. Uh, I've done some work with VMware and at and I currently serve as chair of ACM SIGCOM, where I previously co-chaired the networking channel, an online talk series for the computer systems and networking community. Uh, you can find my full bio in the resources section on your screen. Uh, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with ACM or what it has to offer, uh, here's some more information. ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. ACM provides access to the ACM Digital Library, which is the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature, leading publications and global conferences that draw upon top experts across a broad spectrum of computing topics, support for education and research, including curriculum development, teacher training, the ACM Turing and ACM Prize in Computing Awards, and ACM Code of Ethics, a collection of principles and guidelines designed to help computing professionals make ethically responsible decisions in professional practice. Uh, before we get started, we'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items um, shown in the slide in front of you. Uh, JP would love to take your questions, so please feel free to type them at any time using Zoom's Q&A button. We will organize the questions as JP speaks and try to get to as many as possible. Uh, the session is being recorded. It will be archived. You'll receive an email notification when it becomes available. And you can check learning.acm.org for updates on this and other upcoming webcasts. At the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey open on your screen. Please take a minute to fill it out and help us improve our tech talks. Um, so today's uh, presentation is the impact of ML, AI, ML and AI on networking and the internet over the last decade. And we're very excited to have uh, JP Vashur here. Uh, JP is a Cisco engineering fellow. Uh, he is someone who's extremely well known in our community, uh, both the research and industrial worlds. Uh, since joining Cisco in 1998, he has been working on a number of networking technologies, including IP and PLS, quality of service, traffic engineering, network recovery, uh, the Internet of Things as the chief architect of the Internet of Things, security, wireless networks. From 1992 to 1998, he worked for service providers in large multi-protocol environments. He is an active member of the Internet Engineering Task Force. Uh, he is a co-author of more than 35 IETF RFCs, uh, funders and co-chairs of several working groups, such as PCE and ROLL Working Group, and an active member of several SDOs. JP is the co-inventor of more than 500 patents in the area of, MP, of IP MPLS, security, Internet of Things, machine learning and analytics, and much more. And so we're very excited to have him here today. So uh, JP, without further ado, uh, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matt, uh, for the nice introduction. So let me share the slides. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the ACM uh, Tech Talk. I'm a big fan of his, of his uh, talk. So thank you very much, uh, Jan uh, Timanowski, for helping there. And we have also a prestigious moderator with you, Matt. Uh, as you said, you have a chair of a CCOM, so it speaks by itself. So thank you very much for accepting that. So what we are going to do for the next uh, hour or so is to talk about uh, MLEI and the impact on networking in the internet. So, you know, I I'd like to start by uh, maybe looking back very quickly um, of what happened over the past 40 years. So we know that we have seen some up and downs when uh, talking about MLEI, you know, probably I would say the big jump was in 2010 with the commercial neural nets used for vision and many other applications. At Cisco, we um, shipped our first product in 2019 called Cisco AI Network Analytics for Wi-Fi. I will go back to that, uh, of course. And uh, of course, you know, as we have seen, there was a sort of tsunami of interest in AI when we started to see ChatGPT on November 2022. And of course, I would finish the talk by discussing on how we can use generative AI for networking and AI. There's a plethora of um, topics to cover when uh, we talk about the AI. Many of you have are probably familiar with unsupervised learning, supervised learning, reinforcement learning that have been used extensively in many areas. 
we will see that uh, with multiple use cases, we've been using these techniques of learning uh, to, uh, for multiple use cases. Lately, we've seen more and more self-supervised learning, SSL, which has, been, um, which has been used also in the famous transformer models uh, that are now used in, at the heart of generative AI. I could cover so many uh, topics related to ML AI, such as explainable AI, active learning, transfer learning, which is a way, if you will, to um, transfer the knowledge from a typical model for a given use case to another use case, the ability to do multitask learning. Because we all know that sometimes uh, a given algorithm is really good at performing a given task, but you want to move it to another task, we need to do it again. So this is a very interesting topic. And, you know, of course, I, I need to mention that Versailles, ethical, private AI, and all these topics, all of them are Fascinating, very important, of course, as we move ahead. But that's not the topic of today, right? The topic of today is really to see what we've been doing for the internet and the networking community. What I'd like to do is maybe to start with uh, what is to me a very reasonable principle when we look at technologies and building product with new technologies, which is don't start with the technology and then find a use case. And I'm sorry to say that, but as engineers, we love technologies. I've seen so many beautiful technologies that have died because of an excessive passion for technology. And sometimes we have, uh, you know, again, an amazing technology architecture, and we're trying to find the use case a posteriori. I think that this is still extremely important for academic to you to work on, on these kind of technologies without having a use case a priori. We've seen many, many research that led to amazing innovations. Although when they started, they, we didn't have a use case in mind. But this is more the role of academia. And of course, we need academia. And academia has been playing a very important role when you look at machine learning AI. And I really want to emphasize that. But you know, the way we've been designing product at Cisco using ML AI for the internet was really to focus first on the use case and then try to find the right technology. So let's talk a little bit about Wi-Fi. Well, we all know that Wi-Fi is an amazing technology. Uh, we came up recently with Wi-Fi 6 and then you know, 7, 8, and so it keeps improving. But this is a fairly complex technology. And if you look at this simple diagram, you, know, you go from having to understand the client side, which is in charge, by the way, of selecting the closest access point or the best access point, should I say, we have many, many telemetry uh, points, uh, such as the level of noise, the SNR, signal noise ratio, RSSI, you name it. Then you go to the access point and you get tons of parameters and telemetry uh, sources as well. And then you go to the controller and you can start looking at the CAPWAP tunnels and uh, all these things. And of course, the user is not gonna stop there and very likely will cross the WAN. And if you go to the one, you have a bunch of uh, telemetry sources as well. And if you look at the performance of Wi-Fi, when you're trying to onboard to, um, on the network, you need also to get an IP address. So you may have a GCP server. You may need also to register, authenticate, get information about configuration, and so on and so forth. So if you want to understand the quality of the Wi-Fi network, you really need to look at the many, many kinds of telemetry sources. And this way, you can, you can finally understand the, the user experience. Why am I saying that? Because if you look at, for example, two KPIs, right? One is the time to onboard. So it's very simple to understand. The second one is the failure rate when you roam, which is the action of moving to, from one access point to another. What you, 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 you know is that these are very important parameters for the user. So as a network administrator, how are you going to monitor the network and make sure that the time to onboard or the percentage of roaming failure is not too high? One approach we've been seeing for a long time was to use static thresholds. But the problem is, if you look at this slide, you see that we are monitoring, in this case, multiple networks. And for some networks, it takes uh, 300 milliseconds to join. For other ones, it takes five seconds. And there's nothing wrong about that. 
It may be because of a topology of a network. It may be for many, multiple reasons. If you look at the onboarding, the roaming fare rate, I can exactly do the same thing and say, well, there are good reasons for which sometimes you know you have a high rate, sometimes you have a low rate. Now, let's have a look at another one, which is a throughput. So the throughput is how much of, well, it is a throughput, right? So uh, you know how much of bandwidth, maybe I can say that, should I get as a client? And many people complain and say, oh, it's too, too slow. That must be the network and Wi-Fi and so on and so forth. So for a network administrator, you need to understand if the throughput is as expected or too low. And this is very difficult because you don't have a, a threshold now that you can set because it depends how many clients start we have on the Wi-Fi network, what is the noise and uh, the SNR and things like that. So how have we dealt with these kind of issues without machine learning AI? Well, basically you had a bunch of thresholds and everybody had to do some uh, mapping and uh, configuration of static threshold for many, many KPIs. And of course, you may have to do different values depending on the site and things like that, which is a very cumbersome issue. So it is to me an example when you look at these KPIs where you think, okay, but maybe I need to learn. And that's exactly what you can do with machine learning. So what I'm showing you now is a sort of green band, as you, as you can see, and this green band is computed dynamically for all the access points on the network at a given time. And this is done by a machine learning algorithm that is looking at, in this case, something like 60 parameters. So what the model is going to do is to aggregate all these sources of telemetry, then compute what should be the expected values for dozens of KPIs. And it will also monitor in real time the KPI for the network, which is a blue line that you see on the screen. So in other words, if you look at that uh, KPI, which is the average onboarding duration, so the time it takes to join, you see that for a given location in the network, the algorithm is going to compute how much you would expect. And as you can see, keep changing. And when we see that we're above this value, automatically we say there is an issue with the network. So forget about the cumbersome uh, issues of configuring threshold and all the things, you don't have to do that anymore. It's done automatically. So, okay, that's the part number one. The part number two is, uh, is to say now, what is the root cause? And I won't spend too much time on the issue between causation and correlation. Um, it's very often that we see people a bit confused and they look at the uh, correlated values and basically start to draw a wrong conclusion. Um, so what you should get in this case is a, a layer that is capable of a part receiving an anomaly, say, okay, what is the probable root cause? And in our architecture, we added a layer where the user can basically feed back to the system and say, hey, don't show me this anomaly, I'm not interested. Um, and you may be surprised to see the, the number of times expert don't agree on what is important, not important. So in this case, you can give a feedback to the platform and it will automatically refine what should be shown. All right, so is that it? No, it's not it. You can use ML AI for Wi-Fi for trends. You may want to see a trend of a, an access point being used a bit too much, uh, amount of traffic that we see in some locations so that you can change the capacity planning, for example. And sometimes you may want to do comparative analytics where you would want a system to tell you how you would compare your network with a similar network. And I insist a little bit on the similar network because uh, the dynamics on the Wi-Fi network of the campus is very different than the one that you see in the retail store, obviously. So you want to compare Apple to apples. So it's just to show you uh, a number of uh, very interesting use cases where an AI can be applied to Wi-Fi and we'll come back to uh, 5G and other areas as well. To me, the key for success here is by using this mechanism, by how much do you reduce the number of anomalies raised? Because we all know that if you have a system that keeps raising anomalies, at some point you don't pay attention. When you have to use static threshold, you could either have a low value, in which case you may have to raise, you may have raised a ton of anomalies, including a lot of false alarms. If you put it too high, depending on the nature of the metric, 
then in this case, you're going to miss a lot of issues. In this case, you want MLAI to do that automatically for you, thanks to the process of learning. Okay. So let's talk about other ones, right? Very quickly, I just wanted to show you that example because I think this is an interesting one. With the emergence of the bring your own device and the IoT, we started to see networks with a fairly high percentage of devices for which we did not know uh, the class of, de of device they were. So you may say, well, well, why is it an issue? Well, it is an issue because sometimes you may want to allocate resources based on the nature of a device. You have a camera, you have access to specific resources, you have a, you know, an iPhone, you have access to different kinds of resources. So when the device joins, you look at the nature of a device, which may be advertised using different protocols like DHCP and stuff like that, or you may, and then you may want to allocate some resources. But what do you do if you have a device for which you don't know its nature? So what we have done was basically to say, can I use machine learning now to group together devices for which we don't know their type, but we know that they are similar? And so this way, if you have, let's say, 5,000 devices that are unknown, you're going to get potentially a very few clusters of devices. And you can say to the administrator, you know, I've got five clusters. And if you tell me you look at a few uh, you know, candidates within each cluster, you give me a label, I can start growing a rule automatically. And next time I'll do a better job at, you know, labeling these devices. And so you may say, well, that's super easy. You know, clustering is a very well-known field for machine learning. This is unsupervised learning for the most part, but it's not quite the case because you need to define the distance. And if you have a short distance between two devices, of course, you, they're going to get grouped very likely, but there's a lot of tricks on the method you are using to compute the distance. I will not go to, to that part, but we had to work quite a bit to make it stable. Of course, you need to measure the efficacy, right? So you may look at the purity of your clusters. Are you making mistakes? You know, and you start to mix devices that are in fact different, which is an obvious one. What is the percentage of devices that are alone? and they were not you know, put in any cluster. You may want to look at the number of clusters. You know, if you have very few, you are very likely to have devices of different nature in the given cluster. If you have too many, you ask many labels to, to, to the administrator and so on and so forth. Why am I showing that to you? Because these are the metrics and this is absolutely crucial when you are building a product for MLAI, you need to have in mind the set of metrics that you want to use to assess the efficacy of your system. And this is fundamental. And we go back to that when talking about generative AI, because that's a, a different beast. OK, and then the logical next step was, what if a device now comes in and claims to be an iPhone, although this is not an iPhone, and it could be a spoofing attack? So in this case, you think immediately, oh, well, this is a classification problem. And this is exactly what we did. So what we did was that, you know, when the device comes in, we look at the, the type, the classification, uh, well, the, 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 what the device claims to be. So if the device says, I am a camera, we call the, the classification engine that's been trained to recognize the behavior of a camera. Then what we do using NetFlow, we provide information to the classifier about the behavior of this camera. And we ask the classifier, does it look like the behavior of a camera? If the answer is no, look, you, know, you can use for that uh, SVM, uh, you know, neural network, logistic regression, you name it. Then you, you put under quarantine to say, does it look like the behavior of a camera? Yet another example of machine learning. So in the previous case, it was mostly about clustering and then labeling and growing a, a rule and building a rule automatically. Second one is a typical supervision, uh, supervised learning classification exercise. Okay, now I'm moving on and I'm sorry, I know there's a lot here that is being covered, but I really want to show you the, you know, the most um, I can within the time we have. So, you know, I'm going to be a bit biased, but I think this one is probably one of the most exciting uh, uh, projects that I worked over the past 12 years at Cisco in terms of MLAI. 
Why? Because, um, you know, when I started to think about it, what I wanted to do is to say, okay, is there a way to make the internet predictive? In other words, can I use machine learning AI to start predicting issues before they happen? And there was a lot of skepticism, rightfully, and including me, by the way, because I think this is a very healthy way of building products. You don't want to be overconfident when you start. And, you know, what triggered this was basically to say, look at the internet. And I'm sure um, Matt will come back to that because, as he said, you know, he's also a networking expert. So if you look at the internet, the way we've been designing the internet is to be fully reactive, but there's no learning. Well, you may argue that some protocols have a little bit of learning, but for the most part, there's no learning there. What I mean by that is that the premise is to first detect an issue and then you try to fix it. So 20 years ago, a link would go down, it would take minutes to fix it. Well, let's say dozens of seconds. Then we have improved with uh, you know, some fast IGP, ISIS, OSP, BGP, MPLST, fast reroute, node protection, link protection, all of these technologies. And we were capable of reducing the conversion's time to a few milliseconds. But guess what? It's still too late. You still have the issue, and then you start to reroute the traffic. But there is an impact for the users. So what I started with was to say, if you look at the human brain, it's, a, it's an incredible predictive engine. And anything you do is based on the fact that you predict the consequence of what you are going to do. And if what happens doesn't match with your prediction, you have a signal back to increase the intention and things like that. It's a very complex mechanism. And then you try to improve the next time. And I thought maybe we can do that for the internet. And of course, I knew we could never predict everything, but I wanted to see what we could predict. Three objectives. One is, can I start to add predictive mechanism for some issues? Of course, we will never replace reactive mechanism, but if I can avoid some issues, you know, say 5%, 10%, we go back to numbers in a minute, uh, for the one that I cannot predict, and there are many, then I can fall back to reactive. Second point, which is absolutely crucial, is that we tend to be looking at the layer three only, and as long as the path is alive, you stick to it. What I wanted to do now is to say, no, I want to understand the quality of experience of the application, and then if it's not good enough, then make it an issue so that we can proactively reroute the traffic. Third, I'd like to say that, you know, in some cases, if I'm highly confident about an issue, I can reroute proactively and take some close-up action, you know, um, for that. So let me show you a very simple video. And then I'll go very fast to move to other topics. So in this case, for, for the ones of you that are familiar with sd one what do we have? We have a branch office. The branch office is connected to a data center using multiple technologies. It could be an MPLS tunnel, an internet tunnel, and it may also go directly to the internet, something that we sometimes call a local breakout, so that you can access to Office 365, for example. And you have a routing policy, and you can decide that for some traffic, you're going to be using MPLS tunnels. For other traffic, you do a local breakout and things like that. What we put in place, and the system is in production, by the way, everything that I told you about is in production, we have an engine in the cloud that is looking at every single site, every single path. And the job of the algorithm now, based on machine learning, is to say, if I look at the default path, can I start predicting some issues before they happen? In other words, can I predict a high probability of service level agreement or QE, you name it, um, failure in the next few hours or weeks? Is there a, an alternate path with a lower probability of failure? And third, is there a significant amount of traffic? If the answer is yes, the system will start making a recommendation to the user and say, I believe that you need to change the policy for the next, next few days or weeks on that side. Step number two, you can automate. And the third one will be to have a full closer control. Uh, the second one was really with a human in the loop. Okay. 
I'm not going to go through the algorithm to do that. I will send you some, uh, well, you see at the end of this presentation, there's a website where you can find most, many, many details. We looked at multiple models, the statistical, our own model, LSTM at the time, you know, and, and things like that. Okay, you guys are ready? We're going to move to the next one. So that one is called cognitive networks. And if you're familiar with quality of experience, what we have been doing for almost 20 years is basically for some application to look at three variables, if you will, three dimensions related to the layer three. And these are the loss, the delay, and the jitter. So if you look at the, the extract of the RFC in this case, you see that for some protocol, so some application, we say here is the weight that should be given to loss because. You know, in this case, uh, the application is very sensitive to loss. Uh, this is the weight you should be giving to delay. This is the weight you should be given to jitter. Then you measure dynamically the loss, the delay, and the jitter. You, you use these weights, and you get the sort of quality of experience that the protocol of the user is experiencing. Well, as you can imagine, this is extremely um, rough. Let's put it this way to be nice. And so we chose to, to take a different approach. The idea was, is there a way to use machine learning to learn on the fly what is you know, the real quality of experience of a user? So instead of relying on a static formula with some weights that uh, keep, we keep readjusting and we never know exactly which weight to take and it depends on the, the codec you're using and stuff like that, is there a way to learn? Second, can I also determine what is the root cause? So you can start predicting, not in the, you know, in the context of forecasting, but you, you make an assessment and you say the quality of experience for this given application is not too good on that side. Then you, you, you may want to have to model and say, yeah, but why is that? And we do that with model inspection. Uh, I won't go into too many details, but there's a white paper that goes into very deep details. And of course, the third one might be what is we were to optimize the network in order to improve the quality of experience of a layer seven. And I'm not talking about improving the topology of a network to have shortest delays and things like that, but really optimizing so that we have the best quality of experience for the user. And we managed to do that. Um, that was, again, a lot of fun to do, very complicated, but we managed to show 100 thousands feedback from users. We had a community of 6,000 users for voice and video. We were taking snapshots of metrics across the layers, and we started to map with some labels, and then we trained an algorithm to do that. Um, in my opinion, that was really, really interesting. And we know now that it is possible to do that. So you may probably ask me the question and say, well, what do you mean, you know, do you have to do labeling all the time, you have to do that for all applications. And the answer is, yeah, you may not be able to do that for every single application, but we also know that you, it's not always um, a must. You, you may say, look, I'm going to look at uh, some applications for which I'm going to gather some labels. And you may want to do transfer learning so that once you know how to assess the QE for voice and video, it works for WebEx, Zoom, uh, Teams, and things like that. Um, and you may not have to redo the learning all the time. And you may have a traditional approach for all of your in-house proprietary applications, but at least for the critical ones with a direct Q impact, that could be a very, very valuable solution. All right. So what did I want to, to, you, to, to show you today for this first part? The third, my goal was to show you um, how we have been using MLAI for the internet over the past decade. Give you some examples about Wi-Fi for anomaly detection, root cause analysis, uh, trend analysis, and things like that. I showed you as well the predictive internet, which is another kind of use case. Now we're trying to do forecasting uh, and anticipate, and we see that we finally we can do closer control automation using that. I tried to show you how we can use MLAI for uh, classification of devices, which is yet another area. 
Um, and then the last one, of course, was about quality of experience, which is fairly new because we haven't done so much in the area of QE as an industry. I haven't talked about optical, but there's a lot to say about optical networks and predictive maintenance, detecting you know, uh, degradation of signals and all that kind of stuff. I could have given you dozens of examples. You can apply predictive technologies to SASE, uh, home networking so that we use the best policy um, for exiting your traffic when you go back home, for example. We can predict that Wi-Fi is going to be too busy because there are many people in your house and you can fall back to 4G and all that kind of stuff. Uh, again, there are many, many use cases. Now what I like to do is to show you a glimpse into the future with generative AI and what it means for networking. So. There are just a, a few slides about that one, but I'm planning to post multiple videos. If you're interested, you can see on the website related to the architecture because it's getting fairly complex. In terms of architecture, there are many, many, many components, but also some use cases, results, demos, and things like that. But for now, you know, I'll give you just a, a, few, um, a few examples. So first of all, as I said on the first slide, don't start with the technology. Start with the use case, and then you can start to you know, basically say, OK, what, are, what is the best technology to do that? I'm going to mention just a few, four, to be precise. The first one is, well, the way you interact with a device today, a networking device, is with a UI or a CNI. There are cases where you may want to have a natural language. And you may want to ask any question you want and have a bot or an assistant replying to you. That's the obvious use of generative AI for networking. The second one is about performance monitoring. You know, I like this one because it used to take hours and hours to answer a simple question such as, hey, is there any correlation between the amount of traffic and the number of queue issues? Uh, do you see any correlation between the growth of uh, the, the traffic on Wi-Fi and the number of, uh, you know, lo loss of connection uh, between the, the star and the client, you know, thing like that. So what is a traditional way of doing it? What you would do, you would use your preferred API and vendors. You would pull up a lot of data, use your favorite tool like Panda, play with the data frame and start using multiple statistical analysis and uh, machine learning to understand what's going on. Well, one really cool application might be to say, you know, why not using a generative AI agent and ask to this agent to do the math for you and plot automatically and answer any question you want on the fly. The third one is something I'm, I'm really passionate about because we know that this is one of the biggest pain points. Networks are incredibly important, but they are also very complex. And uh, you know, very high percentage of the time is spent on troubleshooting. Sometimes it could be very simple, only one domain, very easy to do. Sometimes it may involve multiple layers, multiple domains, multiple controllers, and things like that. And it could be very, very time consuming. What if you had a generative AI agent and I would say an architecture behind it capable of answering your question about troubleshooting, you know, I think that there would be a ton of value. And, you know, I cannot show you too much today, but stay tuned. There will be much more on that form very soon. And I, I've been working on that very, very deeply with my team. And the fourth one is, of course, configuration assistance. You want to ask to the bot and say, okay, look at all of my configuration. Tell me if there are ways to improve the security and things like that. By the way, I haven't talked about security. It could be another topic for another time. But of course, MLEI and security has been there basically from a, for, for a long time. Um, has been really a technology of, uh, of use um, everywhere in security. OK, now let me share with you some thoughts. And this is really the way I would like to conclude. And then we're going to take some questions. and. Uh, have a, a bit of a discussion together with Matt. First of all, what I want you to say, and I think this is very interesting, the barrier to entry, when you look at classic machine learning, is now well over. 
when you look at linear activity. So before that, for example, if you look at, a, suppose that you want to write a classifier, you want to design a classifier for detecting uh, the presence of a malware, to take an example with security. What you had to do was basically to look at the data set, do some data cleaning, then uh, ask to data scientists to, to you know, pre prepare, if you will, uh, the data set, also look at some patterns, then you would uh, you know, rely on your machine learning engineers and um, guys in charge of the cloud as well. And there's a very well-known process where at the end of the day, you select your algorithm, you start to look at the metrics and things like that. But the barrier to entry was a bit high because you had to, to do all these steps. Okay, so if you look now at the, the time between when you start the project to when you believe that the product is ready, this is pretty much you know, the yellow curve that you see on the plot. What I mean is with classic AI or machine learning, let's say, you have a plot a bit like that. So because of a barrier to entry, which was fairly high, the issue, or it's not an issue, the nature of generative AI is that you can probably put together a proof of concept within a few days. The problem though, is that you're gonna start seeing that it goes very fast to have a prototype, but it may take longer to have a product ready. And you may of course answer why, you ask why. And I came up with that table. And if we had you know, two days, I would spend two days on just that table. So I tried to summarize in a few minutes. So we talked about the barrier to entry between machine, machine learning, generative AI, very different. When you look at the cost now, what I mean by the cost is how much a compute you need and resources to do the training of the models and the interns. If you look at classic AI, it's of course use case dependent, but if you look at the gradient booster tree, decision tree, even in neural nets, usually you know it's between low and medium. It's not like we're not talking about something very big. For generative AI, if you want to train your model, forget about uh, training a fun, uh, for national model from scratch, like uh, you know, you know, Lama or OpenAI, whatever, or GPT and, and all these algorithms that would take a long time and ton of compute. But if you want to fine tune such an algorithm, you know, it's probably between low and medium. It's not uh, something terrible. Interpretability, super important. What I mean by interpretability is when you rely on a machine learning algorithm or generative AI algorithm, uh, and you get an answer, you know, how can you interpret the answer? How can you explain why you get such an answer? Well, if you look at machine learning, it's, it depends. If you use, you use a neural networks or deep neural nets, well, it could be fairly difficult because you have a lot of neurons and weights and all these things, but there are, you know, interesting research in that space, such as mechanistic interpretability, monosemanticity, all those things. But if you are using a gradient boost tree, very easy. You see the tree, you really understand what's going on, very easy to interpret. But with generative AI, it is fairly difficult to say the least because you have a lot of components and even the transformer itself is very complex. Reliability is to me the biggest issue today with generative AI. You know, reliability is something you can achieve if you have the right data set, the right methodology fairly easily with, with machine learning. But with generative AI, you know, it's not always reproducible, it's not always deterministic, but there are solutions to that. So that's why I'm saying between low and medium, because we have been working person, you know, at Cisco on how to make things very reliable. Uh, I'll post a video on the reliability for generative AI. I'm very optimistic, but still it's good to know. Number of dimensions, what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at the machine learning algorithm, you can play with a lot of parameters. There are some algorithms like AutoML that can tune these parameters. You know, yes, there are multiple dimensions, but it's not enormous. If you look at generative AI and you look at the, the system itself, there are many, many components. It's not just you know, the algorithm. People tend to be focusing on the algorithm, but no, it is about how you are using prompting, what kind of strategy you are using for prompting, how you're using RAG, if you're using RAG. There are many strategies. How you are you know, basically building your prompt, play with the temperature, all these kind of things, the algorithm as well. So there are many, many dimensions, and sometimes, 
you change one of these components <clears throat> and there's a massive impact on the overall efficacy. Efficacy evaluation is absolutely critical. I just posted a blog on that. What I mean is how do I know how well my algorithm is doing? It's, it's kind of difficult with general TVI. You need to come up with metrics and you need to spend time on that. And the pace of change, I'll go back to that one because that's very interesting. So <clears throat> that drives us to the conclusion of this talk. You know, here is what, what I would say. What can we conclude? Yes, we can continue to design, deploy, operate networks as we did over the past 20 years. <clears throat> Absolutely, we can do that. At the same time, look at the benefits that MLAI can bring to networking. Anomaly detection, we talk about it for Wi-Fi. You know, and again, it helps to reduce, you know, the level of noise, the, the number of alarms that you have. It's a killer app for uh, your know, machine learning AI and for the networking. And we show it in the context of Wi-Fi, but of course, there's a, a bigger scope. And you can use exactly the same thing for optical networks or SASE for the web. Predictive forecasting, we talked about this one. There's no alternative. How can you do forecasting if you don't have machine learning at the end of the day? Well, with traditional method, there's no, there's no other way. You need to understand better the application SLA, finally, because we haven't done much there. Automation closer control, yes, you can, you can do that part without any kind of MLAI. And although OpenAI will open some doors, we need to be a bit careful as well because you need to trust the system very deeply before you close the loop. Performance analysis, we talk about that. So what do I believe? I absolutely believe that we're gonna start seeing more of troubleshooting, more of anomaly detection, predictive forecasting and stuff like that for all of the domains of a network. Wi-Fi, we talked about it, 5G, we haven't talked about it because of a lack of time. Line switching, data centers, you know, it's absolutely important for the next generation of data centers to have ways to understand congestion management uh, for the fabric supporting AI workloads, for example, optical, obviously. Multi-layer -layer will be a killer app for MLAI because you need now to look at all of the layers at the same time, do complex correlation, very important, and I'm not even talking about multi-domain, when, for example, you're trying to troubleshoot an issue for a user that goes from you know, Wi-Fi and the LAN and the WAN and things like that, absolutely critical, um, you know, uh, AI will play a critical role. No, now, if I may, I would just you know, give you a few advices based on my experience, because we learned the hard way, believe me, uh, 12 years ago when we started, and it's only when you build product that you do understand how to use machine learning, AI, generative AI, because you try, and sometimes your intuition is totally wrong, and over time you immediately see what is the right tool to use. First advice, don't get trapped in the terminology debates. I've, I see that all the time. So people say, oh, is it statistics? Is it machine learning? Is it real AI? Is it AGI? And I tend to say, we don't care. And there's no, nothing bad in using a statistical model. If this is the right tool, you know, who cares whether it's part of ML or AI? Terminology is not super important. Resist to waves of overstatement. Otherwise, there will be some disillusion. We keep seeing, you know, big statements such as, oh, this is now the AGI. First of all, we don't know what AGI is about, uh, generalized intelligence. So we don't know if we achieve AGI by definition. You know, sometimes we need a bit of nuance. And I think that what matters is that, is it useful? People ask questions also such as, oh, have we matched human intelligence and other things? And again, I don't think this is the right question to ask. Handle pace of changes I could spend an hour on this one. It's not an easy one by far. This is probably the first time in 30 years of history that thanks to open innovation, we start to see the technology moving way faster than we can keep up uh, in terms of product development. And that's not easy because you never know when you need to stop and say, I'm going to freeze my product and resist from moving to another technology that seems to be even better because you need at some point to stop it and to test it and things like that. So, you know, I would just say, apply the appropriate technology to the right problem 
And the only way to know is by building stuff. There are bar barrier entry, you know, that keep going down, but still there are challenges. We need to be aware of that. System level performance efficacy, benchmarking is, is crucial. And what we're going to see next is, you know, AI and Gen AI will continue to evolve at unprecedented pace, solving new problems, bringing new challenges as well. I think that ML AI will continue to spread across domains and layers. I talked about that. And we are going now to see more complex networking problems, such as self-start. You remember self-driving, self-autonomous um, networks, self-learning networks. I think that soon we're going to start seeing that MLEI will become a fundamental component of these networks that will be able to self-improve over time and just build a better network for all of the amazing applications that we see every day. So, with that, we're going to pause now, uh, take some questions, uh, discuss a little bit also with Matt. Uh, if you want to have uh, more information, you can go to that website. I tend to post regular blogs, white papers. Some of them are extremely technical. Other ones are a little bit you know, uh, high level. But don't, don't hesitate. You're going to find a lot of information on these slides. So let me stop there. And I think that we are going to open up the mic. Uh, I promise to do it in 45 minutes, it's 46, but I think that the one minute should be okay. Matt, any feedback from you? This, this talk was amazing. It was, it was so great to see uh, the, you know, the, this such an educational talk. Um, very exciting to see the innovation taking place at Cisco and the work that you're doing, just this super exciting. Um, I'm looking at the Q&A feature on the chat. We're getting a lot of really interesting questions. I'm gonna try and summarize some of them. Um, if, if that's all right with you, and maybe ask you a few questions. Um, one question we're getting is uh, about uh, some of the, uh, you know, false positives and false negatives of uh, some of these techniques. Uh, so anomaly detection is a statistical technique uh, wherein um, there may be false positives and false negatives, you know, very powerful technique and very useful, but um, do you have any tricks for dealing with false positives and false negatives and kind of how do you tune, you know, trade off between those two? Um, you know, is it difficult to do clustering, um, you know, when there's a lot of dimensions? Um, you know, how do you deal with new behaviors that you haven't seen before? If there's kind of new behaviors in the network that pop up, um, are there, are there, are there kind of, you know, it's just goes really good at kind of doing these, you know, practical uh, ways of kind of addressing some of these challenges. I'm wondering if you yeah. um, have, have, have any thoughts along those, those sorts of lines. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for this question. So we're going to start with false positive, false negative, and things like that. So first of all, what people do all the time is to say, oh, it is a false positive. And it depends what we're talking about. So when there is a label, you can say if, it, if there is a false positive or false negative. I'm going to give you an example, which is you want to detect the presence of a malware in a sample. The malware is either there or it's not there. So if you declare that it is there and it is not there, this is a false positive. If you would say, no, there's no malware and there is a malware, this is a false negative. In this case, this is very clear. When you have false positive, false negative, which is a, you know, in the context of a class vision problem, you can start computing what we call recall, precision. The metrics are very clean, you know, very nice, all good. Now, if the, the question is, okay, someone complains and I want to see if you can raise an alarm because there's something like the throughput that is not good enough. In this case, how do you know what is a, a positive versus a negative? It is subjective in this case. And all we can say, and that's a real issue, I'm going to share with you an anecdote very quickly, Matt. Um, I was doing this exercise of looking at anomalies raised by the system. So what I thought was, we're going to do a double blind test and I'm going to run the network of the system on the network, and I'm going to show anomalies to experts. And I'm going to see which experts on Wi-Fi would agree for each anomaly, which one is good, which one is bad. And guess what? You have a lot of uh, anomalies for which people say, oh, it's a good one, it's a bad one. And then you say, why, why is that? Because it's subjective. And so some people, what is an anomaly? Is a, for a mathematician, it's a statical anomaly. For the user, some people say, oh, this one is, a, is an anomaly, this one is not an anomaly. So when you look at anomaly detection, the concept of false positive and false negative is a bit subjective. 
And that's why my advice would be spend ton of time defining what you call uh, good, bad, anomaly, non-anomaly, and thing like that before you start. Because during the course of development of a product, if you don't have a clear definition, you never know if you improve over time or you don't improve over time, and it's getting very frustrating. On the second one, which is clustering, yes, it, it is a big deal because uh, in the case of um, you know, devices, we looked at uh, multiple dimensions. And so if you have two dimensions, that's easy, right? You look at the Euclidean distance and you say, okay, this, these guys, they are closed. This one, they are not closed. And you can use on the shelf algorithm like DBSCAN, super easy. Now, if a device is represented by, with you know, 200 dimensions, wow. The distance in, a, in an hyperplane of 200 dimensions is getting very tricky. So in this case, we had to do a lot of trial and errors, to be honest, and start to play with what is, you know, seems to be indicative of the fact that these two points are different or they are the same. So it took us a lot of time to define the distance. The algorithm of clustering was very easy. And then you look at the purity and all the same, and you say, ah, okay, I need to tune again my matrix. And I love this question because the methodology of evaluating how good is your product depends on the fact that you are good at defining the problem, defining the metrics to track the problem and things like that. New behavior, very good one. Um, and I can mention a few, uh, the Black Friday. So, you know, first time we have a, you know, the Black Friday and all of a sudden you look and you have alarms everywhere. And some people say, but your algorithm was supposed to learn uh, that Black Friday. Well, it never saw the Black Friday the first year, right? So how would you expect that? People say to me all the time, how much time does it take for the anomaly detection system to learn my patterns? And my answer is, well, you guys have been waiting for 40 years because there was nothing before. You can probably wait for a few weeks. And what I mean is, if you want to detect seasonality every week, by definition, you need to wait for a few weeks. Uh, before the system sees it. And yes, there will be events that are unexpected. And in this case, this kind of an army detection mechanism will not be so good for the first time and they need to adjust dynamically. And so that raises the very good point of being able to forget, adapt and forget as well. So there's a trade-off between forgetting stuff and, and taking into account the new behaviors. And when there is a transition, you're going to see a few anomalies that are not expected. The system will do that. Yeah, great. That's that's a wonderful answer. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, there's another question um, that we had about um, uh, large language models for networking. You had some very interesting insights um, on that. Uh, there's there's some questions about uh, are you able to talk more about how Cisco plans to use large language models in your products? Uh, there's a there's a question about um, some of your your examples were focused on operations. Are there use cases that uh, drive monetization for enterprises? You know, can you help enterprises make money with the, with them using LLMs? Um, and uh, and a th kind of a third qu question in in that space is how do you evaluate LLMs? You know, if you as a company uh, are using large language models? Um, are there ways to measure quality of experience with the large language models output themselves? I, do you have any thoughts along any of those directions? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Matt. Uh, this is also a very good, you're, you're really good at summarizing stuff. Uh, thank you for that. So on the LLM side, what I would say is that um, I'm not going you know, to tell you too much about what is coming because that's uh, you know, that will come at some point in not in a very too uh, far future, but we will, uh, we will announce uh, very interesting stuff. So stay tuned, uh, that won't take too much time. On the money side, seriously, that's the beauty of being a technical fellow. Um, usually what I do is just to give it to a product management and say, you guys answer about uh, how to make money. Um, but I want to say something though, which is that if you look at an example of troubleshooting, it's fairly easy to translate that to how many hours you spend troubleshooting the network. And I worked on super interesting projects in the past where you're trying to show that you can increase the quality of experience by 5%. But of course, at some point, you need to look and say, okay, what does that bring to me as an enterprise? 5%, you know, what does that mean in terms of a gain for the enterprise? 
and it's difficult to assess. In the case of travel shooting, it's very easy to assess because you know how many people are in charge of level one, level two, level three kind of use cases and things like that. So um, that's a fairly easy uh, thing to assess. Let's talk now about um, what you mentioned about the efficacy. And this is something very close to my heart because you know, that's not something easy to do for LLM. So I'll give an example. If you are basically, and just published a blog, by the way, on this topic, but if you go back to the classification and exercise, you know that you're trying to say if there's a malware, there's no malware, or you know, something simple like that. As I said, the false positive, false negative, and all these things are very clear, and we have very, uh, very clear metrics, you know, recall, precision, and things like that. So it's super easy because basically the quality of a system is synonymous of the quality of the algorithm. Now, if you look at an LLM, and that's the point I was trying to show at the beginning, very quickly you can have a prototype. You know, within a few days, um, you can have something that sort of works. And once in a while you say, wow, this is kind of weird because the answer is not what I was expecting. This is known as hallucination problems. Um, and, then, and then you ask a question and you say, but how many times the answer is good or, or bad? In some cases, this is very clear because it's pure hallucination. Sometimes like an IP address that starts with, uh, with an A, for example, instead of a number or whatever. In some cases, you look at the answer and you say, wow, is it, is it really a, a bad answer? You know, what is the efficacy of my system? So the reason why this is so difficult is because you need to have a very clear set of metrics that are tied to the use case and not tied to the algorithm itself. So in the white paper, the blog that I was mentioning, I tried to explain that there are multiple metrics like uh, reasoning and many, many types of metrics for general classes of problems, and they are very useful. But when you build a product based on LLM, you can have a many components like the RAG strategy, the content strategy, the algorithm that you use. So at the end of the day, you need to come up with your own platform that you use to assess the quality of the service that you provide. And I can tell you that with my team, we spent months and it will not be a one-shot exercise. We keep improving that. When we have a platform on the side that is in charge of assessing the global efficacy with a few metrics, that when I look at these metrics, I can say, oh, we're doing a good job, a bad job, but this is not something easy to do by far with LLM because of a number of components and the fact that you need to assess whether the answer is not black or white or one, two, three, four, but it's a quality of an answer for the given use case. So I'm sorry, this is a very long answer, but um, it, it's, a, it's a complex problem. And that's why I was mentioning about the sort of plateau when you are going, looking at the time to, you know, for the product to be ready, you're gonna have a long plateau if you don't have a good platform to evaluate the efficacy of the system. It's very important. And I hope that the blogs and the future white paper will, uh, will help you guys. That's, that's another really great answer. Thank you. Um, let's see, I think we have time for at least one more uh, question. Um, there's there's some questions around the costs of AI, um, including the the dollar costs. Uh, if you using ML and AI and generative techniques, um, do you need more hardware to do that? Uh, does it make routers more expensive? Do you need GPUs and routers? Uh, do they increase hardware costs? Um, do they increase development costs? Do you need to hire uh, more engineers, more sophisticated engineers? Um, or does it decrease costs? Maybe you're using generative techniques internally to develop software. Um, you know, and what are what are kind of the pros and cons? Um, there's also some articles in the news about uh, you know staff reductions in our field. You know, employees maybe you don't need as many employees to develop software. Do you force? You're somebody in our community who's very good at kind of predicting the future, and so <laughs> I think there's a question here on um, do you, what do you, how do you see AI in our industry as um, kind of relating to people? You know, do you yeah. force AI in our industry as uh, replacing people or maybe kind of working alongside people to help people achieve more powerful things. Do you, do you have any thoughts along those lines? Yeah, yeah. I have so many thoughts that uh, I may be uh, staying with you for a long time. Um, but I'm going to try to, um, to put some thoughts. First of all, you know, as 
as always, there's a new technology, there's a bit of disruption, things will change. And I think that indeed, with a technology like generative AI, things will change. So my advice is really to say to people, if you are in the networking area, keep your expertise on networking, absolutely, but don't um, try to say, ah, okay, it's not for me, whatever. So I think this is very important to have some uh, strong knowledge on, on ML AI. You don't have to become an ML AI expert, um, but it, it, you cannot afford these days, I believe, to ignore completely ML AI. It is a tool. Second point is, I absolutely believe this is going to be an assistant. You can name it assistant, copilot, you name it. But you are going to use that as a way to help you in your day-to-day -day job. This is true for networking. It's true for ideologists. It's true for many other uh, industries when, you know, maybe at some point, you know, there will be some jobs that will be replaced. But if you look at the legal, they are using, you know, um, this kind of assistant to accelerate some decisions, things like that. There's, there's no doubt in my mind that ML AI will be used in networking uh, area for a lot of tasks that today take a ton of time. But hey, if we can automate some things and use this technology as an assistant, I think this is it would be ridiculous not to uh, take advantage of that. On the hardware side, this is absolutely fascinating. I think that if you look at all of the AI accelerators, we start to see, yes, of course, there's, there's a need for a ton of compute, mostly for the very big financial models. What, what I think fascinating is to see that we start to see the emergence of small models, like um, Mixtral, uh, you know, or Orca 2 and these kind of things. Now we're not talking about GPT-4 with 100, uh, if not a trillion uh, parameters, but very small models that you can fine tune. And the, then in this case, the cost of training will go down. So the, the, the very big uh, companies uh, training for national models will be using a ton of compute, but it's not always be necessary for your own use case. You may want to use fine tuning with LoRa, you know, this kind of techniques or smaller models. And I think there's a very good hope in the future to see models that are way lighter, that can be fine tuned and trained and of course it will cost in terms of inference. That being said, the issue of power consumption is real. Um, personally, you know, I, I have a passion in life and this is neuroscience. And I think there's a, I absolutely believe in bio-inspired hardware like neuromorphic. We've been waiting for some time, but we start to see new approaches that we consume way less in terms of power. Um, it's not there yet, but we start to see chipset that can do that. If you look at the bio-inspired algorithm, um, I have a pleasure to be a, a tech advisor of a company called Numenta. And what they do is basically to be inspired by neuroscience to uh, you know, reduce the, the cost of compute, if you will, thanks to different mechanisms like sparsity in the brain and things like that. And they manage to show that you can run some of these algorithms on a, on a, on a CPU with amazing performances, and you can cut by multiple orders of magnitude the cost of inference. So there are many, many things happening. Um, for some, yes, we'll do more and more compute. For other ones, we start seeing some lighter uh, deployment, maybe at the edge of a network uh, with small models, new techniques of optimization. There will be a mix of all of you above, I believe. I hope I covered um, the several questions um, in that one. Um, but hey, don't don't stay on you know on the side. Jump on that. You're gonna you're gonna love networking even more. I believe when you start using an assistant that helps you with the kind of some tasks. That's really what I believe. That's great. That's another uh, wonderful answer. Um, uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time uh, for today. Uh, I want to thank JP again for his uh, really incredible presentation and and super insightful answers to the many questions that everyone has been asking. Um, a special thanks to the audience uh, for taking the time to attend and participate. Uh, thanks for asking really insightful questions. That was really helpful. Um, this talk was recorded. It will be available online in a few days at learning.acm.org. You can find announcements on upcoming talks and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and acm.org. 
Also, uh, if you could fill out our survey, that would be very helpful, uh, where you can suggest future topics and uh, future speakers. Um, that would be helpful as well. You'll see that on your screen in a moment. Uh, on behalf of ACM uh, and JP and myself, um, thank you again very much for joining us. And I hope you will uh, join us again in the future. And that concludes the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.